So uh, I'm, I'm going to be explaining work with Davide Gaiotto, uh, mostly this paper, but this one is background, in which we try to explain in quantum field theory terms, a new twist on geometric Langlands developed by Edinger, Franklin, and Kajan, but based in part on earlier work by Langlands <coughs> and also on the physics side by York Teschner, among others. So uh, roughly speaking, in the first half of the talk, I'm going to, so okay, first of all, this new twist of geometric Langlands is more concrete in the sense that one studies quantum states and operators on quantum states rather than categories and functors adding on category, acting on categories. And, but as I'll explain in the quantum field theory picture, uh, it can be described by the same ingredients organized in a slightly different fashion. So the first half of my talk will be a review of the traditional geometric line lines as interpreted in gauge theory. And then in the second half of the talk, I'll actually explain uh, the picture developed in these papers. So in the gauge theory approach, the starting point for geometric line lines is a variant of gauge theory that's very widely studied by physicists. It's the maximally supersymmetric or in the jargon N equals four super Young Mills theory in four dimensions with the gauge group G or with the Langlands Gardenoids all of dual group G dual. So either way, the theory has what's called a gauge coupling constant E and it has a theta angle, topological angle theta dual to instanton number and they combine nicely to a complex parameter in the upper half plane. Then the theory has an elementary symmetry that shifts tau by one, which just says that instanton, instanton number is an integer. So the conjugate parameter theta is an angle. And likewise, the dual theory has a dual parameter also with an elementary symmetry. The interesting thing, the highly non-trivial statement is that the theories based on the gauge group G and its dual group G dual are equivalent under an operation that inverts the parameter tau. Now, mathematicians are widely familiar with classical gauge theory, but quantum gauge theory is really the province of physicists until now, unfortunately. Qu quantum gauge theory re reduces to classical gauge theory if E is very small and therefore tau is near I infinity. The fact that this duality inverts tau means that it's impossible for both tau and tau dual to be near I infinity. And therefore, we're never in the regime where we can study both theories classically. That's why, well, first of all, it's why the duality isn't visible classically and therefore is an interesting quantum duality, but it's also why uh, it's difficult to understand. And it took a long decades. The original conjecture was made in 1977. It took roughly two decades before physicists learned to effectively understand this duality and develop confidence that it was correct. <coughs> now, the statement made on this page isn't especially a statement about geometric line lines. And in studying it, physicists are usually asking questions that have nothing in particular to do with geometric line lines. But we can specialize to the situation that leads to geometric line lines. First, we consider a topological twist that leads to a family of topological field theories parameterized by CP1, which I'll, I'll parameterize the CP1 by affine coordinates psi or psi dual. If we study the whole family, we find that we get these trivial equivalences that shift psi or psi dual by an integer, but we also get a quantum equivalence similar to the one we had in the untwisted theory. The whole family becomes the dualities studied by mathematicians working in what's called quantum geometric Langlands. But for today, we'll just consider the basic geometric Langlands duality between psi equals zero for G and psi dual equals to infinity for G dual. By the way, I want to stress that the basic picture is completely symmetrical between G and G dual. Uh, in conventional formulations of Langlands, there's no such symmetry. And from this point of view, the reason there isn't is that we asked a question that was asymmetrical. Uh, the duality statements treated psi and psi dual symmetrically, but we decided to set psi to zero and psi dual to infinity in order to get the conventional geometric Langlands duality. And at that point, we broke the symmetry between the group and the dual group. And therefore, we proceed to make statements that treat them asymmetrically. Now, in general, quantum field theory in dimension D associates a number to a D manifold called the partition function or a transition amplitude or whatever, depending on the precise context. A vector space, the space of physical states to a D minus one manifold, usually envisioned 
as an initial value surface on which initial, initial data are formulated. So in the previous talk, we had initial data for the non Stokes equations. Now we have initial data to which we associate a quantum state or a vector in a space of physical states. And then a category, the category of boundary conditions to a D minus two manifold. In the present context, although the theory is in four dimensions, we're going to specialize to four manifolds of the type sigma times C, where C is the two manifold studied in geometric line lines, and sigma is some other two manifold. We'll keep C fit, we will keep C fixed, but we'll vary sigma. Since we keep C fixed, we effectively will have a two dimensional topological field theory that depends on C as a kind of parameter. So we'll be doing two dimensional topological field theory, but it will depend on C. So then we define, in this case, in this situation, we define a category of boundary conditions that depends on C. Remember, in co dimension two, we define a category since. C is kept fixed, co-dimension two means co-dimension two and sigma are just a point. So point contains no information, but we have is just a category that this theory associates to C. Now I'm going to be drawing some two-dimensional pictures in which I only exhibit sigma. So if sigma has a boundary, so it's a two-dimensional picture, but there's a Riemann surface that's hidden that's not drawn at all. What I've drawn here is a Riemann surface with boundary the boundary shown by this black solid black line. There might be other boundaries or something else somewhere else. I'm only drawing the picture near this boundary. If sigma has a boundary, then to formulate quantum field theory on sigma, we need a boundary condition. Or in other words, we need an object in the category. The reason boundary conditions make a category is that given two boundary conditions, B1 and B2, well, in a category, we should have harm from B1 to B2, which will be a vector space in this context. It's the vector space of physical states that quantum field theory assigns to this picture. In other words, if I'm given two boundary conditions, I can draw a strip with the boundaries labeled by B2 and B1. Uh, sigma is understood as oriented and the arrows keep track of that orientation restricted to induce, induce orientations on the boundary. So in this picture, we could then have one manifold stretching between the two boundaries. And the space of physical states in that situation we interpret as harm from B1 to B2 in this category. So with this definition, for example, harm from B to B is an algebra for every B. Um, if I have a sort of a pair of pants, again, times a Riemann surface C that's not drawn, labeling all boundaries by B, we would sort of have two elements of harm from B to B coming in and one going out. And so the quantum transition amplitude for that two-dimensional surface will give us the multiplication in the category. And another picture I didn't draw will show that it's associative, although not necessarily commutative. And some more pictures also not drawn. Well, I could draw it. The picture that would show it's associative is this one, with you now three elements coming in. Well, we'd have to draw some more pictures to show that we could think of it as multiplication in two different orders. And some more pictures where some of the boundaries are labeled not by the same B, but by different B and B prime, will show us that harm from B to B prime is a left module for harm from B prime to B prime and so on. So after a little while, we would discover that two-dimensional topological field theory is more or less equivalent to having a category, the category of boundary conditions. And here we have a category, we started in four dimensions. So we have a category for every C. So, but also we have two different descriptions based on G and G dual. So electric magnetic duality will give us an isomorphism between the category curly C associated to C in the G theory at psi equals zero and the dual category associated to C in the dual theory at psi equals infinity. Well, in addition, there's a natural mapping between certain natural functors on C and C dual. And these functors come from what physicists call line operators. So in general, in quantum field theory under manifold M, a line operator is some sort of modification of the definition of the theory on an embedded one manifold K. So at psi equals infinity, the natural line operators, the simplest line operators are what physicists know as Wilson operators. Wilson operator is simply the holonomy of a connection. We're doing gauge theory. So if we have one manifold, we can take the holonomy of the connection along that one manifold. <coughs> 
That's a classical expression. Mathematicians will know it as a classical expression. In quantum field theory, such classical expressions become promoted to quantum mechanical operators. So then the holonomy interpreted quantum mechanically becomes an operator called the Wilson operator. The natural dual line operators at psi equals infinity are more sophisticated things that physicists know of as at hoofed operators that turn out to be related to the geometric Hege functors of geometric line lengths. Actually, last week at a conference in honor of Atiyah, I sort of explained this part of the story in more detail than I'll have time for today. Now, in physics, the Wilson and the Tuft operators are usually used in analyzing confinement of quarks in atomic nuclei and other subtleties about universality classes of quantum field theories. In fact, this would get us relatively close to one of the clay problem, clay winding problems, although not quite. But well, what I wrote is not quite, but the Hoft was kind of thinking about the issues underlying the clay problem when he introduced the Hoft operators. For us, though, a line operator is a functor from the category of boundary conditions to itself. <clears throat> we can understand that statement from this picture. So here is a boundary of our picture. Here is a line operator, which could be supported on any one manifold, but I've chosen a one manifold that runs parallel to the boundary. And of course, there's a Riemann surface C not drawn. The boundary exists everywhere on C, but the line operator is localized at a point in C. That'll be important in a little while. Now in A, the point is that a line operator running along a boundary with some boundary condition B just makes a new boundary condition TB. After all, we're doing topological field theory, so the distance between T and B is meaningless. We could bring T all the way up to the boundary. And whatever it is, we'll just get a new effective boundary condition that we'll call TB. So that explains how T acts on objects of the category, what it does to morphisms is shown in B. Well, do I explain the composition law in the category before had to do with pictures like this? But, um, well, if we were doing a conformally invariant theory, well, we actually have different morphisms, but even conformally, we could conformally map this kind of picture to this one, where a morphism just appears as a, a dot on the boundary, where the boundary condition possibly jumps or possibly not. But anyway, there's some modification of the boundary condition along a point on the boundary, possibly with the change in the boundary condition. That would be an element of, that's a, a picture representing an element of harm from B to B prime. And then another dot um, from B prime to B double prime. And the picture is meant to tell you that a morphism from B to B prime, if I compose it with T, will give a morphism from TB to TB prime, obeying whatever axioms you think it should obey. So I've been drawing pictures in two dimensions, but remember there are two more dimensions not drawn, and T really depends on the choice of a point in C. Such pictures make it obvious that the line operators TFP and TFP prime to begin with for distinct points in C. So the picture represents acting on B with first TFP and then TFP <coughs> prime. And in general, in such a two dimensional picture, TFP and TFP prime don't commute. If you multiply them in the opposite order, you'd get a different picture with the P line to the right of the P prime line. But we're really in four dimensions. And as long as the points P and P prime are distinct, we can move the two line operators through each other with no singularity, so they must commute. So the two dual categories, C and C dual, are equipped with dual families of functors parameterized by a point in C and some more data that I haven't stressed, and commuting at distinct points. So TFP corresponds to the usual Hecke functors and geometric Langlands, and WFP corresponds to its dual and the usual geometric Langlands duality, which is more elementary. And well, I made various more statements in the rest of the slide, but maybe uh, we don't have to go into quite that much detail. <coughs> uh, to go into a little more detail, I want to introduce a useful language for a slightly simplified version of geometric Langlands duality. So let M sub H of G and C, 
be the modulized space of Higgs bundles of G on the Riemann surface C. So Hitchin showed it's a hypercalar manifold. In one complex structure, it parameterizes Higgs bundles. In another complex structure, it parameterizes flat bundles with the structure group, which is the complexification G sub C of the compact gauge group G. And then these two complex structures are actually part of a hypercalar structure, and there also are the corresponding hypercalar forms. So a useful approximation to geometric Langlands duality is that it's mirror symmetry. So um, <clears throat> we could, so this Higgs bundle moduli space has a lot of different complex and symplectic structures. But in particular, you could take one of its symplectic structures, which was omega K in Hitchin's notation, and one of its complex structures, which Hitchin called J, and they're actually mirror to each other in the conventional sense of mirror symmetry between symplectic manifolds and complex manifolds. This instance of mirror symmetry, well, it has antecedents in the physics literature, but mathematically it was first studied by Housel and Thaddeus. So a good approximation to uh, mirror symmetry, um, to, to, to geometric Langlands duality is this mirror symmetry. That was kind of, well, I puzzled, I'd been, well, Atiyah had suggested back in the 70s that a connection, there should be some connection of Montana and Olive duality with geometric, well, with Langlands. He, he didn't phrase it in terms of geometric Langlands because geometric Langlands, as it's understood today, didn't exist yet. That was formulated by Balenson and Drinfeld roughly around 1990. In other words, roughly a dozen years later. And because I was familiar with uh, Atiyah's speculations, and also because it was obvious from the beginning that Balenson and Drinfeld were using a lot of physical ingredients, for many years I wondered uh, how the story could be connected to physics. But there were a lot of obstacles to understanding it in detail. So for many years I couldn't make any sense out of it. Uh, it was actually a lecture by Ben Zvi, who did not say this, but who said something somewhat similar, which was phrased as a sort of asymptotic statement rather than an exact statement. At a conference here at the Institute, organized by Ed Frankel, especially, to try to educate physicists about geometric islands, that got me started in really understanding it. After Ben Zvi's lecture, I realized that a better approximation would be this statement, and that the really true statement was to get was in four dimensions. And that eventually led to the story that I'm kind of trying to tell you about today, except that time doesn't really make it possible to explain it properly in one lecture. Anyway, an approximation is a mirror symmetry between two moduli spaces. But mathematicians working on geometric Langlands know well that completely correct statements aren't statements about finite dimensional moduli spaces. The conventional formulation is that you should have to work on the stack of G bundles, not on a finite dimensional moduli space. The physics counterpart of that statement is that you have to start in four dimensional gauge theory, not with a two dimensional sigma model. The two descriptions might sound different, but they're really the same because the TN Bod explains back in 81 that a model of the stack of G bundles is the space of all connections on a fixed smooth G bundle, E over C. Unfortunately, here G is a complex Lie group, and here it's the underlying compact form. So four-dimensional gauge theory can be viewed as a two-dimensional theory with the target being bun G. So when mathematicians somewhat abstractly talk about working on the stack of G bundles, for physicists, what that means concretely is that you should do four-dimensional gauge theory with the translation between the, between the two statements being essentially what a TN box had. Now, I want to use the two-dimensional description, though, to motivate the statement that the category on the automorphic side of the duality is a category of D modules on bun G. Well, so on the automorphic side, we've got an A model category or a Fukaya category of a real symplectic manifold Y, namely the Higgs bundle moduli space, viewed as a real symplectic manifold with the symplectic structure, the Hitchin called omega K. The most familiar brains of the A model are Lagrangian brains supported on the Lagrangian submanifold L. But Kapustin and Orlov discovered that in general, you can also define quasitropic A brains that are supported on the quasitropic submanifold that's above the middle dimension. 
you, they discovered them because they needed them to make mirror symmetry work. They observed that in general, the traditional statement of mirror symmetry is not true if you try to use only Lagrangian brains. And they fixed it by including coastrotropic brains. The construction of coastrotropic brains is delicate in general and not very well understood, in fact. But the simplest case is the case that we need for geometric language. That's the case that Y is actually a complex symplectic manifold with complex structure I and a holomorphic symplectic structure omega. And one is viewing it as a real symplectic manifold whose real symplectic form is M omega, the imaginary part. And moreover, you take the B field to be the, to be the real part of omega. That's one formulation. Kaposin and I actually phrase it a little differently. With that data, you can construct a canonical quasitropic A brain, BCC, I'll call it, whose support is all of Y. So this is an extension of the Fukaya category as studied by mathematicians to include additional A brains that physicists consider to be necessary in the story, basically because all the, well, one thing is that you can define them. It turns out if you look for them, they have the same supersymmetric properties of conventional Lagrangian brains, but they were discovered because you need them for mirror symmetry. So it has extremely unusual and fascinating properties. Roughly, harm from BCC to itself is related to deformation quantization of the algebra of holomorphic functions on Y. So, well, more specifically, well, this is perhaps not the most general statement, but one statement is that if Y is the cotangent bundle of some other complex symplectic complex manifold W, and the holomorphic symplectic structure of Y is the standard complex symplectic structure of the cotangent bundle, then you can show that this Hom space is the sheaf of holomorphic differential operators on W, twisted by K to one here. So in the case of geometric Langlands, we take Y to be the Higgs bundle moduli space. It's birational to a cotangent bundle, as was shown by Hitchin, where M of G is the moduli space of holomorphic G bundles on C. So the Hom space is the sheaf of holomorphic differential operators on the moduli space of bundles. And so therefore, if B is any other brain, for example, all the Grantian brain, the more familiar brains in the Fukaya category, perhaps, then Hom from B to BCC is going to be a module for A, which is Hom from BCC to itself. So um, since A is the sheaf of differential operators, we learn that the category of the automorphic side of the duality will be, roughly speaking, a category of D modules on the ordinary module space. This was the interpretation by Kapustin and me of the statement formulation by Bell and Sandrinfeld on the automorphic side. Now, mathematically, you have to work with D modules on the stack bond G node on a finite dimensional moduli space. Physically, what that means is that um, this strange coisotropic brain, the, the one that extends the Fukaya category to include deformation quantization, can be defined directly in four dimensions, not only after reducing to two dimensions. Kapustin and I, well, frankly, we struggled with this. We had a version of it in our original paper that was cracked, cracked but not very informative. Gaiato and I later found an improved version. And this improved version let us understand as physicists one of the important results of balance and Drenfeld. So the question is, uh, what's the dual of, of this peculiar brain BCC itself? So BCC, the one related to differential operators, is an A brain of the Higgs bundle moduli space of G. So its dual will be a B brain of the dual moduli space. In other words, a coherent sheaf or a complex of coherent sheaves on the moduli space for the dual group. And Balenson and Drinfeld, in a different language, had shown what the answer was. Its dual is what's called the structure sheaf of the variety of operas, a very special Lagrangian submanifold of the dual moduli space. I'll kind of give a definition later near the end of the talk. I won't pause to explain right now exactly what was the Balenson and Drinfeld statement. But anyway, in the physics, it was important to understand why this was true. And, uh, we sort of got such an explanation uh, a few years after the original one. So uh, in summary, the main ideas in the gauge theory of geometric Langlands correspondence, at least in the traditional form of the correspondence, which involves statements about categories and functors, 
as opposed to the analytic version, which will, in more recent developments, which will be the subject of the second half of my talk. The main idea is as much as I can summarize them on one slide are as follows. There is duality between the gauge group and the dual gauge group for supersymmetric gauge theory in four dimensions, twisting to make a dual pair of topological field theories, compactification to two dimensions on a Riemann surface C that you keep fixed in the rest of the discussion. The dual theories have dual sets of line operators with the Hoft operators related to the geometric Hecke transformations and dual Wilson operators associated to representations of the dual group. Then there's this, on the automorphic side, this distinguished brain BCC that establishes a map from A brains to B modules. On the other side, one is studying B brains in the, on the complex structure in which Hitchens moduli space parameterizes flat bundles with the structure group, the complex group. So I apologize for zooming through that much too quickly, but it's as much as I can do to kind of summarize the traditional uh, story. Now, however, there is one more point I want to make about the traditional story before I go on, because this will draw a contrast with the work of Edinger, Frankel, and Kajan. The story so far involves deformation quantization, not quantization. And I want to take a moment to explain the difference very explicitly. And I'll take the concrete example of two sphere, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals a constant j squared, viewed as a symplectic manifold with its usual rotation invariant symplectic form, which you can write this way, although that way to write it isn't manifestly rotation invariant. In deformation quantization, you start with the commutative algebra of functions on the two sphere. And for example, you could consider polynomial functions and maybe complex valued polynomials. So this ring C of X, Y, and Z with this relation. And you want to deform this to a non commutative And it's supposed to be an associative algebra. You specify that the leading non commutative deformation should agree with the Poisson bracket. And you ask if there is a family of associative algebras over a power series ring C of H4, or maybe, maybe formal power series, or maybe over a polynomial ring with this property. The difference is that in this case, you can set H bar to an actual numerical value like it has in the real world. And in this case, you have to think of H bar as a formal variable and work with formal power series, like perturbation theory in H bar, without being able to set it to an actual numerical value like 10 to the minus 27 or seconds in the real world. So in this particular case, we can write down the answer. It's given by the SU2 Lie algebra. The associative algebra generated by X, Y, and Z with these relations and essentially this relation makes sense for any value of j squared. And well, the associative algebra with these relations uh, makes sense and satisfies the conditions of deformation quantization. But that's not quantization. We haven't quantized the parameter j. It could be any real number or even any complex number in what I've said so far. Quantization means finding a Hilbert space h of the appropriate size that the algebra acts on. It doesn't exist for arbitrary j. To construct the Hilbert space, you have to quantize the parameter j, set it to preferred values at which the Hilbert space <coughs> exists. And those special values correspond to the angular momenta in the real world. And it's because of this step that the subject is called quantization. So in the lecture so far, I told you that because of the composed and Orlov quasitropic brain, the, the, the A model, or at least the extension of the Fermiya category in the right context, is related to deformation quantization, but not to actual quantization. But Gukov and I asked whether the A model in this general setup can describe quantization and not just deformation quantization. And the answer is yes, under certain conditions, which I have to explain because we need them for the application to geometric lines. Recall in general, we're discussing to, to, get, to get deformation quantization. We're discussing a complex symplectic manifold, Y, viewed as a real symplectic manifold with the real symplectic form m omega. So now let's discuss Lagrangian A brains. Well, these are A brains supported on the submanifold L that's Lagrangian for m omega. In many examples important for geometric line lines, L is actually a complex Lagrangian submanifold that it's, is it's Lagrangian for omega, not just m omega. For example, if you take a skyscraper sheaf on the G dual side, that means a sheaf supported on the points. 
it's dual as a Lagrangian brain, a complex Lagrangian brain that's actually supported on a fiber of the Hitchin vibration. That happened because a, a point is hyperholomorphic. A point is holomorphic in every complex structure, which forces the dual to have special properties, which lead to it being Lagrangian for both the real and imaginary parts of Omega. So it's actually a complex Lagrangian brain, Lagrangian for Omega, not just for M Omega. But in general, L not, need not be Lagrangian for Omega, just as a coherent chief need not have any additional properties. Mathematicians studying geometric line ones don't even mention the possibility that a chief could be hyperholomorphic. So it's certainly not a requirement. The Gukovs and I considered the opposite case of an A brain B. The support is Lagrangian for M omega as is required in the A model or Foucault category, but a symplectic for real omega. And then we argue that in this situation, HOM from B to BCC represents a quantization of M with symplectic structure real omega. So that makes sense because we assumed that M is symplectic for real omega, so we can try to quantize it. And uh, we claimed that the HOM space is then such a quantization. And so, for example, if Y is actually an affine variety, then you can show that holomorphic functions on Y, which were deformation quantized in the previous picture, uh, act on this quantum Hilbert space with appropriate properties so that you can think of it as quantization of certain functions on M. So this page really should have been a lecture, but you can't really do it. But um, I'll just have to make the assertion that if we, so the previous case, we had a complex Lagrangian brain. Now we have the opposite case, symplectic for M omega, sorry, Lagrangian for M omega, symplectic for real omega. And then I claim that in that particular situation, the A model knows about quantization, not just deformation quantization. I think that this probably should have interesting applications well outside of geometric line rooms. But anyway, for today, we'll head for geometric line rooms. So, well, there's an important detail. I defined the Hahn space in general as a vector space with what Y is a Hilbert space. This page is devoted to explaining what we need to make it a Hilbert space, not just a vector space. And basically, we need an anti, we need M to be a real submanifold of Y. That means there's an anti-holomorphic map from Y to itself with M as a component of its fixed point set. <clears throat> so for example, at lunch, I was reminded that Nash proved that in four dimensions, every M is such a fixed point set of anti-holomorphic involution of a complex manifold. Uh, even a complex algebraic variety. So we need M to have that structure. And the quantitative, but the point is that if you give an M as a real manifold, uh, its structure as a real algebraic variety isn't natural. You have to pick one. So here we have to pick one, and it should have some nice properties. I don't really have time to explain, but why roughly should, why should have a good A model in the sense of physicists. Roughly, the A model of Y has to be defined over um, power series in H bar, not just formal power series. Sorry, polynomial functions in H bar, not just formal power series. So uh, you can't start with any M and any complexification. It has to be nice in a sense I don't have time for. All I will really say is that the Higgs bundle moduli space is nice in the appropriate sense. So then, given tau, there's a nice definition of the Hilbert space in your product using well, universal properties plus this term. So in this approach to quantization, if you're given a real symplectic manifold that you want to quantize, first you have to find a complexification of it to a complex symplectic manifold Y with some appropriate properties. And then you can use the A model of Y to quantize M. So that might be compared loosely to geometric quantization. In geometric quantization, you have to pick something, a polarization, roughly a maximal set of Poisson commuting variables, and then you get a recipe for quantization. So in either case, you may, in either case, quantization is not completely natural. It can't be. There isn't a natural map from symplectic manifolds to quantizations. There's always some additional structure, either the complexification or the polarization. And either one can give good results if there's a natural choice. That's a 
our choice is natural for the problem at hand. Uh, Gukov and I didn't understand very much about how to compare the two approaches, but Gayoto and I, motivated by the work of Edding or Frankl and Kajdan, wanted to understand this better. We found criteria under which geometric colonization and colonization by brains would ring. So it, on the, at the very beginning, I mentioned two papers, and one, one of them just was devoted to this point, really. We re-examined re quantization by brains to understand better its relation to geometric, line, uh, geometric quantization. Now, all this is by way of preparation to talk about the work of Eddinghoff, Frankel, and Kajdan that I mentioned at the start. So they considered a Hilbert space H of L2 functions or better half densities on the moduli space of stable homomorphic bundles on C. Then they construct operators on H that are related to the usual constructions of geometric Langlands and found interesting duality theorems and conjectures about the action of these operators. I'm not going to make the statement, explain their statements. So we're going to proceed with the physical setup and see what the statements might be. So, uh, first of all, in geometric quantization, L2 functions on M are related to quantization of the cotangent bundle of M. So in other words, the Hilbert space of EFK is what you get if you take the Higgs bundle moduli space with real symplectic structure omega and quantize it via geometric quantization using the fact that it's a cotangent bundle. But if we're going to get anywhere in terms of predictions from duality, you need to understand this quantization by, by brains. So for this, the first step is to make a complexification of the higgs bundle moduli space that has some properties that I tried to explain, although I zoomed through it a bit fast. Well, the higgs bundle moduli space is a com complex manifold. Any complex manifold viewed as a real manifold has a canonical complexification, namely the product y1 times y2, where y1 and y2 are two copies of y, taken with opposite complex structures i and minus i. So i was the complex structure on y. We take i and minus i on the two factors. So then y hat has an involution that exchanges the two factors. It's anti-homomorphic because we took opposite complex structures on the two factors. And its fixed point set is the diagonal, which is a copy of y. So we've realized y as the fixed point set of an anti-homomorphic involution. And it's, we can take the homomorphic symplectic form of y hat to be half omega on the first factor and half omega bar on the second factor. Then the restriction of this omega hat to the diagonal is real omega. In other words, y is Lagrangian for m omega, the diagonal is Lagrangian for m omega. This should be m omega hat and symplectic for real omega hat. So this is the situation in which quantization of y using a Lagrangian brain supported on y, where y is interpreted now as the diagonal in y hat. Makes sense. Moreover, the real polarization that leads to the Hilbert space cited by Eddinghoff, Frankel, and Kajdan does have the right properties that enable Gaiota and me to compare geometric quantization to quantization by brains. So therefore, the Hilbert space they used can be studied in brain quantization. I didn't want to just tell you that um, that stuff was important. Otherwise, we can study brains and gauge theory all we want. But how would we know it was related to the quantization that was assumed by Eddinghoff, Frankel, and Kajdan? Now, what are the observables in brain quantization? Well, here we should remember Hitchin's integral system. The Higgs bundle modular space has a Hitchin vibration over a complex manifold that just Cn for some n. For linear functions when the base or Hitchin's commuting Hamiltonian. And classically, the global homomorphic functions are the pullbacks of functions on B. In other words, the algebra A0 of homomorphic functions on the Higgs bundle moduli space is the algebra of polynomial functions of the Higgins Hamiltonians. Well, what are quantum observables? Well, for brain quantization, we have to define this funny quasitropic brain on Y hat. It's just a product of quasitropic brains on the two factors, since uh, y hat was a product, except with opposite complex structures and different symplectic structures. So you find that the algebra that works on quantization of y is just a tensor a bar, where a was hom on one side, a bar is hom on the other side. 
And these are just quantum deformed versions of the algebras of Hitchens commuting Hamiltonians and their complex conjugates. But in this particular case, you can show that even after quantum deformation, the two rings still commute. That's due to Hitchens for SL2 and to Bailson and Drinfeld in general. And the quantum deformed objects are commuting differential operators that are quantizations of Hitchens classical commuting Hamiltonians. There's also an explanation by gauge theory of the fact that the quantum deformed ring is commutative. It's similar to the explanation I gave at the beginning of the commutativity of the Hege functors. Now we want to understand how these observables act on the Hilbert space of L2 functions on the moduli space of stable bundles. First of all, there's no mystery about the fact that the algebra does act. That's just the statement that holomorphic and anti-holomorphic differential operators on M of G can both act on functions of M of G. Since M of G is birational to a cotangent bundle, the algebras have an interpretation as differential operators on the base, so they can act on functions on the base. Holomorphic operators trivially commute with anti-holomorphic ones, and the algebras of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic operators are separately commutative. So A tensor A bar will have an action on functions on the base. It's a commutative algebra, so they can be simultaneously diagonalized. And then we can ask, what are the joint eigenvalues of Hitchens Hamiltonians and their complex conjugates? To answer this question, we want to apply duality. Well, to apply duality in this situation, where the quasi-tropic brain is a product of two brains, naively, we need to understand the duals of the three brains involved. So these are quasi-tropic brains on the Hitchin moduli space and another copy of it, and B is supported on the diagonal. So um, B, the first one, is the brain associated to deformation quantization. And as, as I mentioned before, a reinterpretation of a result of Bailenson and Drinfeld is that it's dual as the structure sheaf of the variety of Opers, a certain Lagrangian submanifold. And similarly, the dual of the other one is the structure sheaf of L pair bar, the Lagrangian submanifold that parameterizes flat bundles whose anti-homomorphic structure satisfies the pair condition. So I've zoomed through this pretty fast. But two of the brains here have duals that are essentially now by a reinterpretation of a result of balance and Drinfeld, which, as I told you, Guyton guy and I struggled a lot with at one point. What about the brain supported on the diagonal? Here, there's an old folding trick that shows we don't have to worry about doing anything. So we had two copies of Y, which really meant two copies of the four dimensional gauge theory. And away from the boundary, well, in the bulk of the two manifold, they're completely independent. So you could think of it as two sheets. And then the boundary condition associated with the quasi brain doesn't make them interact. It's just separate boundary conditions for the two copies. But on the other boundary, we have this brain supported on the diagonal, which glues them together. So we have two sheets that are simply glued together over one boundary. If you unfold it, we just have a strip of twice the width with one quasi brain on one side and its cousin for opposite complex structure on the other side. And in the middle, the black line is where the fold used to be, but nothing's happening there because gluing two things together on the diagonal did nothing except saying that the fields on the left and on the right agree on the common boundary. So we just got a single theory on a strip of twice the width with two different Lagrangian brains on the two boundaries. So we dualize the two boundary conditions to get two conventional objects in the Foucault category. So in this, uh, with, with this mod dual moduli space viewed as a real symplectic manifold in one of its real symplectic structures, these guys are just ordinary real symplectic manifolds. And we now simply have two objects in the conventional Foucault category. The unconventional quadratic brain has gone away after the duality. This, now we're in a, in a world that people who do the Foucault category will be familiar with. So the algebra A becomes harm from this uh, Lagrangian brain to itself. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I made an uh, embarrassing error. Sorry. The dual is on the B model side. So these are not, okay, they were Lagrangian with you. But remember, there's a lot of structure 
that I warned you about before because of all the complex structures. Here on the B model, so we're, the structure sheet for the variety of ochres is a coherent sheet. So my, my statement, however, was, was true in a different world. We're now in a conventional mathematical world with two coherent sheaves and a complex manifold. And we're just looking at intersections between two coherent sheaves or hum between two coherent sheaves. So one algebra is hum from one sheaf to itself, that's just the algebra of holomorphic functions on one complex Lagrangian submanifold. The other is the algebra of holomorphic functions on a different complex Lagrangian submanifold. So here are the two dual pictures. I erased the central line, which didn't do anything. So we had a strip with two unconventional A model boundary conditions. The dual is a B model with two conventional B model boundary conditions. So now the physical states here in this description, the physical states are um, uh, L2 functions on that moduli space of G bundles. But in this description, the physical states are harmed between intersections between uh, two coherent sheaves. So harm from one coherent sheaf to another. And that has a basis that lives just on the intersection points. So in this case, well, adding our Franklin Kajan conjectured and in some cases proved that these two Lagrangians have discrete intersections. And so the Hom space just has a basis with one basis vector for every intersection point. And that's supposed to be the basis that diagonalizes the Hitchin Hamiltonians. So, so maybe I need to say what an O pair is. The definition of an O pair is a flat bundle that viewed holomorphically is a non trivial extension. I'm defining it just for SL2. So for SL2, an O pair is a flat SL2C bundle. If you forget it's holomorphic, if you forget that it's flat and just view it as a holomorphic bundle, it's an O pair holomorphically if it fits into a non trivial extension. And similarly, it's an O pair anti holomorphically if it's a non trivial extension <coughs> anti holomorphically. The statement that's elementary but possibly unfamiliar is that these conditions can both be viewed as holomorphic conditions in the, home, in the complex structure where you're studying flat bundles. And the complex structure comes simply because SO2C is a complex, complex leader. So um, in this picture, we just have the intersection between two complex manifolds, one flat bundles that satisfy this condition, the other flat bundles that satisfy this condition. There's no algebraic structure in which those conditions are algebraic. If there were, there couldn't be infinitely many discrete intersection points, as is actually the situation. So, um, well, okay. So, as I explained before, using the anti holomorphic involution, this Hom space has a Hermitian inner product that you expect to be positive. The dual space does also. And you can show that the uh, intersection points have to be up. Non degenerate, as conjectured by Edinger, Frankel, and Kajdan, and proved in some cases, in order for the inner product to be positive. So, explicitly, well, I think I'm going into too much detail here for the time, but explicitly, you can show that if the intersection points, let me explain this a little bit. So, consider an intersection point. An intersection point is a flat bundle E that's an opera both holomorphically and anti holomorphically. Then the anti holomorphic involution that's used to define the Hermitian structure will map a flat bundle E to the complex conjugate flat bundle E bar. And that will also be an opera both holomorphically and anti holomorphically, since complex conjugation will map the holomorphic structure of one to the anti holomorphic structure of the other, and vice versa. If E isn't isomorphic to E bar, you can show they're both null vectors for the Hermitian form, which in that case isn't positive definite. But the duality predicts it should be positive. So we expect that, as in one of the conjectures of Edinger, Frankel, and Kajdan, E is always isomorphic to E bar. The claim is that a flat bundle that's both an O pair and an anti O pair, that's an O pair both holomorphically and anti holomorphically, is actually real. I suspected 
the structure was actually display real form, but that wasn't clear from the physics point of view. The physics point of view gave some additional interesting predictions about these intersection points, which, is, uh, which there isn't a really time to explain now. So assuming the duality is true and their emission form is positive definite, the joint spectrum of A and A bar corresponds to real ochres. Now let me recall two statements of Valentin and Drinkfeld. An element X of the ring of Hitchens Hamiltonians has two interpretations, according to them. It's a holomorphic differential operator on the moduli space of bundles, and it corresponds to a holomorphic function on the variety of ochres. The complex conjugate statement is that an element X prime of the complex conjugate ring is an anti-holomorphic differential operator and is a holomorphic function on the variety of anti-holomorphic ochres. So an intersection point of the two Lagrangian submanifolds determines a pair of eigenvalues of the two differential operators, namely the values of the functions fx and fx prime corresponding to x and x prime at the point p. And this is the proposal for the joint spectrum of Hitchens quantized Hamiltonians. So Edinger, Franklin, Kasha, and also introduced Hecke operators as operators on the Hilbert space H that arises in quantization of the Higgs bundle moduli space as a real syntactic manifold. So I already explained that line operators give functors on the category of boundary conditions or brains. And moreover, there are dual pairs of functors in the A and B model categories. The same line operators represent operators on the quantum Hilbert space. In fact, the reason, what I'm about to tell you is the reason physicists call them operators. So I've tried to explain it with the following picture. Previously, we took a line operator that runs parallel to the boundary. And we interpreted it by moving it up to the boundary as a functor in the category of brains. We could, however, take the same line operator and let it run from left to right. We have to say something about the endpoints where it ends on the boundary. But if we postpone that, this picture is going to give a quantum operator, an operator in physical states, simply because if you start in the input with a physical state, and you do your quantum field theory transition amplitude, the output at the top will be some other quantum state. So T will have determined some kind of linear transformation on the space of quantum states. <coughs> the last picture, I'll kind of skip it because of the time, but the purpose of the last picture is to explain what kind of data are needed at the endpoints. And from this last picture, you can see that the corner represents a hum from one brain to another. So the argument that showed commutativity of the functors associated the Hecke functors as viewed as functors on boundary conditions immediately shows that the corresponding operators viewed as operators on quantum states also commute. Because they live at different points in C, we can move them up and down past each other in this picture with no singularity. And as in the discussion of line operators as functors, oh, I'll skip the last thing. The same argument shows that the Hecke operators commute with the quantized Hitch and Hamiltonians. Again, you can move uh, Hitch and Hamiltonian up and down past the Hecke functor because you can assume that they're localized at different points on the hidden Riemann surface C that hasn't been drawn. Last question, or the last question at this level of generality is what are the predictions of the duality for the eigenvalues of the Hecke operators? Well, to answer this, we'll start on the G dual side. We're going to find the eigenvalues of a Wilson operator, W of P, acting on the Hamm space. And then the duality will predict that the eigenvalues of the Hecke operator on the automorphic side will be the same. Also, we'll find what kind of data is needed for the corners or the endpoints of Wilson operator on the boundary. Well, since I'm taking a little bit too much time, I'll try to go through this a little bit briefly. So first of all, we start with a, a G dual bundle over E with some connection over the four manifold sigma times C, and also a representation R of the dual group. To that data, we can, there's what mathematicians call an associated bundle. E is a G bundle, but we, there's an associated bundle E sub R in the representation R. It also comes with a connection. And then WR of gamma for a path gamma in sigma times C 
it is defined as simply the holonomy of this connection along gamma. For the present application, we fix a point P in the Riemann surface C, two points A and B on the left and right boundaries of sigma, and a path that runs from A times P to B times P, this path. Then if E sub R at A times P and E sub R at B times P are the fibers of E sub R at the left endpoint and the right endpoint, then parallel transport defines for each connection a linear transformation from one fiber to the other. Or to state it more symmetrically, it defines an element of the Hahn space from one fiber to the dual of the other fiber, sorry, from one fiber tensor with the dual of the other fiber into C, where R prime is the dual representation to R. So that's possibly, that's what we get from parallel transport. Now, a quantum operator will come from a complex valued function of connections, which we don't yet have. What we have so far is that for each connection, we defined a linear transformation from some vector space to C. To get an operator, we need to supply elements in the two vector spaces. And then this linear transformation applied to V tensor W will be a function of connections and its quantization will be an operator that we can easily understand it as it turns out. To avoid unnecessary details, I'll specialize to the case that the dual group is SL2 and the representation R is the two-dimensional representation, in which case the dual representation is the same. So in this picture, the boundary condition on the right boundary was that the G dual bundle E restricted to the right boundary is an anti-holomorphic OPA, which by definition means that there's a non-split exact sequence where K bar is the anti-canonical bundle of C and K bar to the one half is a square root. So if we pick a vector V in the square root of the anti-canonical bundle, we get a vector J bar of V in this fiber over here. Similarly, on the left boundary, the boundary condition tells us that ER prime has a sub bundle K to the one half. So if, if we pick a vector in K to the one half, now the square root of the canonical bundle, we get a vector J of W in the fiber. And once they're picked, we have a complex valued function of connections that we'll interpret as a quantum operator. It's just W, w applied to J bar of one vector tensor with J of the other vector. Well, interpreting this as an operator is trivial because in the B model, we can actually assume that the connection is pulled back from C up to a possible twist by an element of the center of the dual group, which for SL2 C, this should be, is plus or minus one. So up to sign, W hat is just the natural dual pairing between the two fibers. And therefore its value at a given real OPA is simply up to sign, which comes from the center of the group. The pairing in the two dimensional representation of SL2 between the two vectors. So, this is the answer of Eddinger, Frankel, and Kajan for the um, eigenvalues of the Hecke functors. So, the duality predicts that on the dual side, the definition of TFP as an operator, first of all, requires the same data we used. That's true as was shown by EF and K using an algebra geometric formula. And then the duality predicts that the eigenvalues of the resulting operator will be what we found on the dual side, namely this, for all possible real opers. Both signs do occur that's related on the G side to the fact that minimal Hecke modification of an SO3 bundle acts non-trivially on the second C4 So uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't probably resist the temptation to explain a little bit too much in one hour. But what I've tried to do is to at least sketch the gauge theory interpretation of geometric line lines, and then to tell you how the analytic version of the theory fits into that frame. Thank you. That's an intriguing lecture. Uh, so once again, apologies to the people joining us online. We can't, don't have the capacity to take questions from you. But is there anybody in the room who would like, like to ask a question? Say, why, uh, why do you have to generalize the uh, um, Fukaya category by including co isotropic things? Well, the original argument, the original example of co composite analog was to take two generic elliptic, product of two generic elliptic curves. Um, then, for special complex structures, there are holomorphic objects that don't exist generically. For example, the diagonal, if they're the same one, which generally complex multiplication. Yeah. 
But if, if when they happen to have complex multiplication, they're more holomorphic objects. Then they had a particular, in this case, because the elliptic product of two elliptic curves is flat, they could be completely explicit about the duality between the B model and the A model. And the exceptional complex objects, their duals were not Lagrangian duals. They were coisotropic brains. And then they went on to show that the coisotropic brains they were getting have quite fascinating properties. Uh, I would say most of which are still a little understood. To, whatever is understood about coisotropic brains is quite fascinating. Anybody else? Well, let's thank Edward again. <laughs>